As I said on the floor, if, if POMV is medicine the state has to take to cure its deficit, that may be one thing. But to force the, uh, the state to swallow two glasses of poison, that is an income tax or a, uh, and, and an oil tax in order to wash down that first, that's just inappropriate. You know, the POMV should stand on its own uh, rise or fall, not be linked inappropriately to other measures that are not popular and very controversial. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, James Brooks from the Juno Empire. I was curious about the vote on the effective date clause that we saw fail yesterday. We had also seen the same thing uh, happen with the budget. And I was wondering what the strategy is, what the thoughts are on that. Um, thanks, James, for the question. There's no strategy. Uh, we, we don't uh, agree with piece of legislation. Uh, we don't agree with it being implemented. And the strongest way we can let that message be heard is to allow and not allow the effective date clause until something comes back before the body that we can agree to. Can I, can I add to yesterday's effective date clause? One of the one of the challenges that I had with the bill is that there was a uh, a um, the effective date well, went back to the previous year, That's right. and um, and so that retroactive uh, effective date was one of the concerns. It, it would draw 1.6 billion out of the earnings reserve, taking it out of the high earning uh, permanent fund, and it would put it in the general fund where it would really not make much. And so, uh, in addition to I just couldn't support the bill as as it was. That was one of the concerns that I had up in finance and that others had was that they were putting a retroactive effective date on it. So I think that's part of the things that I would ask as they as we come to a discussion point here at this uh, time frame now that it's been passed out of both bodies, that they consider that. And I think they might find some people willing to, uh, once, we, once support is gathered, um, that, that you might see a different outcome in terms of the effective date as well. Good morning, Liz Rains with KTVA. Representative Pruitt, you've questioned the legality of the contingency language in SB 26. Can you explain why? Yeah, so the, the reason I've ex that I question the legality is, the, you know, the Constitution appropriately said you cannot put more than one subject in a bill. Um, it, sometimes it's referred to as log rolling. And bills have been challenged in the past um, and it gone to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has backed that up. The idea is that we don't want a piece of legislation to pass because you had to put on the little add-ons here and there to be able to give everyone kind of the goodies that they needed to, to get it passed. When they put that contingency language, it was, a, it was basically saying, let's try to find a legal way to log roll. And I don't know if it's legal. And I think that if someone challenged, if, th if this were to pass, uh, which uh, it's not going to pass, but let's just say that it would. I, I think the same challenge that would have come up. Remember, they 115 was split because, and I and I'm 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 going to use an ADN article. I was I was criticized for this the other day in finance, but it was passed because Representative Seaton said we have split those two up because there could be a lawsuit that would void both issues. And um, one of the key people out there that have indicated that that could become a challenge would, is Bob Gillum. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a relevant piece because I think it would have failed if he had sued. I think the same challenge could come up here. You haven't technically put it in the bill, but if someone were to go to sue on one of those two issues and essentially make them null and void, what they need to ask themselves, are they willing to throw 26, are they willing to throw the restructure out the window because they wanted to get those so bad? Because I think it's possible that a lawsuit could tear the whole thing down. And then we're back where we started and we're two years behind where we are now trying to deal with getting this thing behind us and moving forward in Alaska. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Quinn with Bloomberg. It's a kind of a two-part question. The first is, earlier you said that um, you, you were critical of the um, majority for taking a, a my way or a highway approach, and then you stand firm against an income tax. So isn't that the same kind of uh, posturing? And um, the second part of that question is economists who have come to this building the last uh, two or three years and have uh, held forums have said the state needs a statewide uh, broad-based tax and that's not part of your plan so can you speak to that too please sure so on your first question isn't that holding firm uh, protecting the private sector economy is something that we're firm on doing making sure that middle class America middle class Alaska isn't taxed before we uh, address the issues of our bloated 
government, right? So you've got to you've got to reduce the size of government before you can go out and really honestly ask Alaskans, will you help pay for government? They don't think it's right size. Matter of fact, 60% of Alaskans don't want an income tax. Um, so I think holding firm and protecting Alaskans is something that we have to do. Um, your second question, uh, remind me what it was, sorry. You know, economists have come into this building, various committees, uh, right. and talked about the need for a, a statewide tax of some kind. And that's not part of your plan. So I'm, I, I could kind of reconcile that. So on that question, I will tell you that uh, there's economists on both sides. As a matter of fact, ICER has said that we shouldn't pull all the levers at once. We heard them come down and testify that we shouldn't do a percentage of market value, we shouldn't do an income tax, and we shouldn't do the oil and ta gas tax structure all at once. That is too much for an economy that's already stressed. And that's exactly what the House Democrat majority is doing. So I think that a measured approach, we've always talked about a measured approach in um, our group, that we should, we should structure it in a way that we can see the effects that each major has on the economy before we go forward with the next economy. Lance, you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I'd, I'd add to that. It was also Harvard economists that told uh, Russia when they were moving from communism into capitalism to take the shock approach. And you saw how that happened. It essentially led to the oligarchies and some of those challenges that they have now. Um, but beyond that, let's get into the effect of, uh, you know, income tax itself. Uh, if, you're going, if your concern is that government has enough money and that we have more than money than we need, then yeah, you're going to need an income tax or some sort of broad-based tax. If your goal is recognizing that money in the, in the hands of the private sector has, the, has a uh, larger ability, and we've heard that from ICER, we've heard that from economists, that a, a dollar in the private sector can circle seven times as opposed to a dollar in, uh, in government's hand, which will circle three times. If your goal is to leave it in the private sector hands, then an income tax is not what we need to be doing. Add on to that that we're going to start taxing our people with $5 billion in our CBR. Right? So we're going we're gonna to die with fairly wealthy. When the truth of the matter is, is if we measure our approach and we continue to cut, cut our spending and you allow for that growth in the permanent fund that will spin off more money for that POMV, you get to a point where you have parity in the size of your government and the amount of revenues that are coming in. And so there's no need to get more money now because you'll find yourselves in the same situation as we grow government to the maximum amount of our revenues the next time we have a big crash. And what are we going to do then? Because you don't have an income tax available to you and you don't have the permanent fund. You've already shouldn't put everything out on the table. So it's time to be measured. And that's why we have to be, that's why I am firm on making sure that we don't use all, pull all of our levers at once. Yeah, you know, there, there's a uh, saying that I think Rahm Emanuel said, it's a don't let a good crisis go to waste. And a lot of money and a lot of effort has been expended in the last year or two to try and foment the, the feeling of a crisis. Um, and the fact is we have seen um, oil prices have gone up. The unreported oil production increases are not reflected in current numbers. The, uh, the economic forecasts are old and we've been waiting for the new spring revenue forecast. I think when that information comes up, there's going to be less of a crisis than people think. And I don't think that Alaskans want an income tax. That's pretty clear. So I think we're seeing the, uh, the, uh, the dying gasps of an effort to try and impose an income tax on people that they don't want under the uh, pretense of a crisis that's not as bad as people think it is. Good morning, Matt Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. Um, the majority argues that um, a plan, a fiscal plan that does not include an income tax is unfair because it basically puts the, by, by taking an equal amount of permanent fund dividend away from every person in Alaska, it uh, would disproportionately impact people with smaller incomes. Do you guys believe, um, you know, based on your stated opposition to an income tax, that um, the Bob Gillums of Alaska should contribute no more to fixing the problem than, uh, you know, your average person making $50,000 a year? Yeah. I, I will take that. This, the speaking for myself right now, 
The permanent fund dividend is a uh, something that each Alaskan gets by virtue of being Alaskan. It's not a means-tested program. If you're poor and need money, you don't get two dividends. If you're rich, you don't get half a dividend. It's what you get as a citizen of Alaska. And, uh, you know, we don't have an entire class of, as I said, rich uncle penny bags. You don't make policy based on a couple of outliers. Bob Gillum is not Joe Alaskan. He is a very, uh, he's an outlier. He makes a lot more money than most people do. So to try and, and, and foment a tax based on how it's going to affect a, a millionaire, multimillionaire, is not fair, it's not fair public policy. And, and I would I'd just add to that that I think that's the most important piece to remember here is we're not we're not there's a there's only a handful of people that would fit into that that particular category the the majority of the people we're talking about are Joe and Jane Alaska and you know when you start pulling out from uh, say a retired couple that all they have is Social Security and pensions but they happen to be above that thirty thousand dollar mark you know, it doesn't take much to dramatically influence their quality of life. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about here. And so to say that somehow, and we heard that term used in finance the other day, that people that are paying tax are somehow of privilege. If it, because of the way the structure is, they, they all of a sudden they're privileged. That's not the case. We have to be very cognizant of what we are doing to these people, whether or not they're going to be able to eat, whether or not they're going to be able to buy clothes, find fuel for their cars. And so that is, the, that is what we have to be considering. And, and that's why you find me so passionate about the income tax discussion, is because they're real. And by the way, <coughs> they're also losing their jobs right now. And I heard that yes, I heard a story last night about a young a person who just took a job not too long ago uh, in, as a contractor for an oil and gas company and they were just laid off within the last two days because that's the reality of what we're facing and do we really want to add to that that uh, pain by now saying you're going to be taxed for what you did make this year mm -hmm. even after you were let go so so is it fair to say that you guys are comfortable with a plan that takes an, an equal amount from every Alaskan regardless of income well I think what we're, we're, we're I mean, right now, we're not comfortable with the plan that the House Majority Coalition put forward because we didn't have any input on it. We couldn't have the discussion. At every turn when we tried to have the honest discussion about what a plan would look like, uh, again, Nat, you watched some of the hearings. You watched our floor session. Uh, our, our, our ideas are not worthy of their uh, time, so it's unfortunate. Go ahead. Can I do that mm -hmm. briefly? Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's a matter of perspective and a, and a focus. I'd rather see the state have policies that encourage a stronger economy and that, uh, you know, the basis of our economy and our foundation of our prosperity is the oil industry. And I think on the other side of the issues we're not talking about, instead of arguing about how we divide up the scraps, let's try and grow the pie. Let's have a stronger economy, more opportunities for people to work and generate new revenue, not just taking each other's laundry and try and share the wealth that way, but let's create new wealth. I think the oil tax policy that the Democrats are pursuing are contrary to that. We should encourage more production and more wealth. That way we don't have to argue about who's going to get the last couple of bucks. Becky? Becky Bohr at the Associated Press. Representative Millett, you said earlier that there's no conversation with House Democrats right now. Um, I just wanted to be clear, have, have have, has the discussion broken down because of some of the concerns you've had, or has there been no substantive talks? And then how does that bode as we head into this next phase when there's going to be negotiating on a budget? Yeah, that's a really great question. So talk, uh, let's talk about the conversations that we have with the House Democrats. Um, all of our leadership team at some point in time have been have been talking to Representative Edgeman and uh, had great conversations. Most of it was niceties we're going to we're going to hear your bills we're going to pass your measures out we're going to you're going to be included in the budget conversations you're going to be included in the fiscal plan conversations and as we've gone forward and i've said it probably every press con conference i've been on i was optimistic that would happen uh, unfortunately i think representative seaton and representative foster decided what they were going to do as part of a fiscal plan and really honestly didn't want our feedback we've seen that time after time uh, you know I empathize with our finance members up there trying to do and get our ideas is implemented in any type of bill that's in front of finance again on the floor where that's my committee because I sit on no other committees that see legislation uh, to be uh, limited and to be you know basically uh, made fun of because we have a lot of amendments and a lot of ideas and shamed because that that happened a lot on the floor with our uh, many amendments that our, our members had that came forward it's unfortunate because you know doing the 
work of the state of Alaska, that's the floor session. That's what you signed up for. You signed up to hear 40 different ideas. And, and if it takes time, it takes time. I always respected Representative Chenault because he never limited debate. He never limited the time that we would spend on the biggest uh, constitutional requirement that we have. It was always an open and honest debate on the floor. No voices were ever stifled. We don't see this with this uh, with this coalition. Um, they're, they're afraid of language on the floor. They're afraid of uh, we slush funds. They're afraid of the word bureaucrat. I mean, they're hypersensitive to the dialogue. There's nobody impugning anybody's motives on the floor. We're trying to have a conversation. Um, so it's unfortunate. We have not had very uh, deliberate conversations with Representative Edgeman, Speaker Edgeman, on what the end of session looks like. They took our three-quarter vote away. It's obvious to all of us they don't really want to hear from us. Uh, they want to uh, rule with an iron fist. It doesn't work out. Um, that, that's not the way you get to, to the end game. And it's unfortunate um, that that's happening. But no, we have not had substantive conversations with, uh, with uh, Bryce and his, his group. Mm -hmm. And if I may, um, I'll even go one step farther. Uh, for conference committee, operating budget, the minority, since I've been here, has always been allowed to pick who their member was going to be from their finance group on, uh, on uh, uh, the committee. As of yet, uh, we don't know who our member may be because we've not been allowed to pick that member yet. So. So with that, and we've hit the 9.30 mark, we'll stick around for questions. But um, thank you uh, for your time and patience. And um, I look forward to probably having a press conference maybe on day 90 uh, or day 91 or day 110 or whatever it's going to take um, for us to stick around. We are willing to stay here and do the hard work. So thank you for attending.